Good evening. Do nice men always finish last? Does being an unimpeachable gentleman mean that the rough and tumble of Indian politics mars your efforts at leading the country? In an increasingly hostile world, are the words peacenik and pacifist viewed as code for weak and relenting? Former Prime Minister and two-time Foreign Minister Indra Kumar Gujral was laid to rest in New Delhi after he passed away last week. I.K. Gujral and his well-known Gujral Doctrine guided India and its foreign policy during the time he was Prime Minister. The Gujral Doctrine was a five-point roadmap which sought to build trust between India and its neighbours, a solution to bilateral issues through bilateral talks, and to remove immediately quid pro quos in diplomatic relationship between India and her neighbours. The Doctrine has its critics who felt that India would be surrendering intelligence assets in neighbouring countries without any surety that neighbours would keep their side of the bargain of not harbouring any anti-India activity. Based on the premise that Indians, uh, India's stature as a regional power cannot be divorced from its equation with its immediate neighbours, the Gujral Doctrine was seen to be a serious effort at reaching out to Pakistan. Over the years, though, particularly after a series of terrorist attacks, the Gujral Doctrine came to be criticised, particularly the prime, uh, prime Minister, then Prime Minister Gujral's decision to dismantle India's military ability to launch covert strikes against anti-India militant groups like the lashkar e toiba and such like. In the absence of proactive support for foreign policy, his foreign policy outlook, Gujral's reliance on the Track 2 route led to assessments and implementation that helped him in forcing the predominantly pacifist doctrine. The late former Prime Minister is widely regarded as an intellectual who made a significant mark on the country's foreign policy. His stint as Prime Minister from April 97 to May 98 was far too brief to leave a lasting impact, but he did manage to resist signing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which helped the next government conducting the Pokhran nuclear test without any hitches. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight on The Big Picture, we take a look at the Gujral Doctrine and its author. We try and understand the role it played in its heyday, in his heyday, and the country's as the country's leader and the relevance of his foreign policy today. And I have with me in studio, in the studio, uh, Vinod Kumar Sharma, political editor of the Hindustan Times, as well as Shashank, former foreign secretary of uh, at the, in the Ministry of External Affairs. Also joining us on the program will be retired Major General G D Bakshi, who is a defence analyst. I'd like to start the show, however, with Mr. Sharma, if I could. Mr. Sharma, uh, I.K. Gujral was a gentleman in politics who became an accidental prime minister. But before we get to the discussion on the Gujral doctrine itself, I want to talk about the man himself. In an age when coalition politics was just beginning to take root uh, in the country and the country was going through a transitional phase, he oversaw the uh, affairs of the country. What would you say was his biggest achievement as prime minister then? Well, he came at a time when, <clears throat> you know, being prime minister was a difficult proposition. Before him, Mr. Debe Gowda had to demit office under pressure from the outside supporter, namely the Congress, uh, because there wasn't enough chemistry between him and the then Congress President Sitaram Kesari. And Mr. Gujral became the compromise choice consequent to Gowda's departure for the simple reason that he was perceived as one who had the ability, the administrative acumen to run the country without posing a threat in terms of his mass base to any of his uh, contemporaries. He was uh, not a mass leader, but at the same time, he was a man with tremendous administrative experience. He had been minister in Indira Gandhi's government. He had been our uh, ambassador to Soviet Union. And in Indira's government, <coughs> you know, he uh, is often derided. He was in a lifetime derided as a bit of a softy, you know, but he wasn't. Uh, he always stood up when he, uh, and he had the courage to be counted in a minority of one. He refused to take the diktat of the former Prime Minister uh, Indira Gandhi's son, uh, Sanjay Gandhi, when he was Information and Broadcasting Minister. And he ended his career on the same note, refusing to take the Congress diktat 
uh, on uh, on DMK's position in the coalition. He refused to, uh, you know, junk the DMK uh, because uh, there was a report against them by the Jain Commission, Jain Commission which report. probed into the in the Rajiv Gandhi right. conspiracy case. So Mr. Gujral was a gentleman uh, in his etiquette and in his behavior, but he was a man of uh, strong political beliefs, and his Gujral doctrine was a product of that. Right. It was not a product of his weakness. It was a product of his strength right. uh, as a politician and as a philosopher, statesman, who felt that India had a stellar role to play in the region in order to show the way to the region right. and find the way for itself. Right. On that note, sir, I'd like to get the former diplomat on the panel to say something on the Gujral doctrine itself. Uh, uh, Mr. Shishank, uh, as a former diplomat yourself, at that time when the Gujral doctrine was really in force when he was prime minister, do you think it's, it paved the way for a future behavior of a country that was that that is poised to be a, a, an emerging superpower now and already was then a big regional power? Do you think it served that purpose? And and how do you remember Mr. Gujral as a diplomat, uh, in spite uh, of being you know in office, outside office? Well, he had been our external affairs minister also before becoming the prime minister, so he knew the intricacies of diplomacy very well. I remember him telling us often that somehow or the other, over the previous 50 years, our diplomacy had become more structure-oriented rather than the contents-oriented. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the diplomacy to move into its real arena of content, building conceptualization. And even after his retirement as the Prime Minister, he would always tell me that he had met several bureaucrats, but he found that the conceptualizers were mainly in the Foreign mm -hmm. Service. Mm -hmm. Others were trying to do day-to-day -day kind of implementation of work, of course, doing very good job. Mm. But he said that the conceptualizers he found only in the diplomatic service. So that was, I think, a great tribute to people who are uh, small strengths within the uh, government, but still they are able to carry this uh, task which is assigned to them. And as you are asking this question that Gujral doctrine did pave the way, in a way, of other powers, especially superpowers, considering India as a major player. Mm, mm. Of course, we had to later on get on with the 7-8% growth rate to show our uh, economic potential. But in terms of foreign policy. But in terms of foreign policy, that what does India want? Does India want a peaceful neighborhood? Mm. Can India contribute to somehow modify the working methods of countries like Pakistan, China? India may or may not succeed. At least an effort was made mm. at that time by not simply saying that, all right, you don't work against us, but also to show them that we have a way out, right. which will be a kind of win-win formula, For everyone. and that will also help you. But Gujarat doctrine, one thing I must say very clearly, that at that time it was misunderstood because it was felt mm. that he wanted to extend unilateral uh, benefits to all the neighbors whom he thought that they were the younger brothers mm. of India. Right, right. But actually he always said that China and Pakistan have to be treated in a different manner because there are there is a past background mm. which has to be kept in right, mind. Right, right. I, I want to get uh, General G.D. Bakshi in on the, on the discussion right now. Before we actually uh, go into the intricacies of the Gujral Doctrine, I want to get your first reaction on what you really thought of the Gujral Doctrine when it came into uh, being and, and, and your thoughts of Mr. Gujral as a Prime Minister, uh, as a gentleman Prime Minister. Very briefly, sir, then we'll go into the main discussion. Uh, look, one would like to pay a personal tribute to somebody of that eminence and stature. Uh, I'm, uh, unfortunately, all that I would like to state is that the way to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> the intent was extremely noble. I fully agree with the policy uh, posture that to your smaller neighbors like Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, act as the big brother, act magnanimous, you know, without expecting a quid pro quo, you sort of uh, uh, give them the unilateral concession. That was perfectly in order. But as far as Pakistan is concerned and as far as China is concerned, uh, you know, we in the military were certainly a little disappointed because, uh, you know, it is the kind of Munich syndrome that, of course, who doesn't want peace? But unfortunately, these are neighbors that have not reciprocated. And you find the fact that all that I would ask you to do is go on to the terrorism, uh, the South Asia you know, portal for terrorism. And it tells you that from 1994 till date, 64,045 Indians have been killed. This doesn't include the Indians, you know, in terrorist violence. 
This doesn't include the Indians who were killed in the first phase of, phase of violence in, you know, JNK, in the JKLF phase. That's about another 30,000. Right. General Bakshi, uh, if I could interrupt you for just one moment, I want to ask you one quick follow-up question before I go back to Mr. Vinod Sharma. Even reluctant admirers, General Bakshi, of the man, except that the Gujral doctrine became something of a symbol, something of a totem uh, at that point. They admit that the spirit of uh, the Gujral doctrine has governed India's relationship with its neighbors since then. And it continues to determine uh, India's foreign policy even during the time uh, of the NDA government, the ideologically opposite NDA government of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, would you say then, General Bakshi, that was only after the doctrine was implemented did India start behaving like the responsible regional giant that it is now? Would you at least agree to that? No, I would certainly agree that as far as Afghanistan is concerned, as far as Nepal is concerned, Sri Lanka is concerned, Bangladesh is concerned, Maldives is concerned, this is absolutely the right stance to take. I would have my reservations on Pakistan, very serious reservations on Pakistan, because the unfortunately it has not worked. As we see it, despite the best of intentions, despite the best of will, we haven't been able to make it work. We have been bleeding. It is the responsibility of the nation state to try and seek peace. It is equally the responsibility of the nation state to protect the lives of its innocent citizens. Right. Point taken. Point taken, sir. I'll take a sw short break right now. I'll come back and go straight to Mr. Vinod Sharma uh, to get his reaction on what General Bakshi just said. Also, a couple of other questions on my own. Don't go anywhere. Keep watching the big picture. Welcome back to the big picture. We're discussing Indra Kumar Gujral and his uh, now famed Gujral doctrine. Mr. Sharma, what about the fact uh, that it amounted to almost unilateral disarmament on India's part and left the conduct of international diplomacy to, uh, to an abiding trust in the goodness of others, as he used to call it. Hawks all over the world regard that as anathema to them, uh, leaving your flanks open, leaving your uh, rear guard completely open to attack by non-friendlies, even non-state actors to some extent. Did the Gujral doctrine rely way too much much on the inherent goodness of others, of non responsible men on both sides, something that we rarely see nowadays in this increasingly hostile world. I have a story to tell. Yes, please. I wish to demolish the myth that Mr. Gujral was an unadulterated uh, uh, romanticist. No, he was a realist. When he became <coughs> foreign affairs minister in Devi Gauda's government, uh, may I say that he sought for me for the simple reason that I had been in Pakistan until the mid 90s. And Mr. Gujral became foreign minister in 1996. And that was the time when his critics were sort of, uh, you know, dismissing him as a Kaju Barfi diplomacy person, you know. Uh, and Kashmir was, uh, uh, was, a, was a big issue between India and Pakistan at that time. Uh, people normally forget that at that time India was on the defensive on the Kashmir question. And Pakistan would often tell us that, uh, you know, you create a climate properties for dialogue, then we'll have a dialogue with mm -hmm. you. Now, Mr. Gujral told me a story that dated back to 1979. Moin Qureshi, then perhaps the vice president in the World Bank, came to see Mr. Murarji Desai, who was prime minister. Ziaul Haq was the president in Pakistan. And Murarji Desai told him that, look, one formula that can ensure peace between India and Pakistan is to set up industry along the borders on either side mm such industry which is dependent for supply of raw material or, or, or from across the line. Right. Now, he got very, uh, very, very excited by the idea. He sort of meeting with Ziaul Haq and he, had a, he was immediately granted a meeting and uh, Ziaul Haq was also, according to him, quite enthusiastic. And while they were discussing, you know, little small little slips will come and he'd read them and keep them aside. Now, after the meeting, Mr. Moin Qureshi went home. He later became, if you remember, uh, their caretaker prime minister right. in 1993 right. and next morning he woke up to his horror to read in the newspapers that Zulfikar Bhutto has been hanged. Hmm. So Mr. Gujral told me this story to convey that he harbored no illusions about Pakistan, hmm. Hmm. that he understood the mindsets but at the same time he had the courage that he was willing to risk hmm. 
politically in in, in pushing ideas out of box out of the box ideas like the one mr muraj ji sai proposed right, in right. May, as back in 1979 right right so mr gujral was no romanticist hmm. he was a realist it's just that he had a soft exterior right and he was a, he was an archetypal diplomat and that was look at mr shashank does he look like and, by any stretch of imagination a belligerent person he's and, not and that that but he's firm in so far as defending the country's interest and in that what, what 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 that's what people mistook for weakness sometimes yeah. another contention uh, shashank if i could come to you another yeah. contention is that unilateral concessions backed by peaceniks like gujral uh, like prime minister gujral which have they've since become institutionalized this is uh, the the this is something that is the critics of the Gujral doctrine keep going back to. Now they say that that not only failed to earn the goodwill that it was supposed to but actually signaled weakness which enemies in surrounding countries have used to their advantage. Would you say sir that the Gujral doctrine although well meaning and intellectually sound was made for an ideal diplomatic scenario something that the subcontinent has rarely seen in the past four to five decades? Well, the question which you have asked me I kept asking Prime Minister Gujral several times after his retirement as the Prime Minister as to why did he pose this Gujral doctrine mm. and giving unilateral concessions to a country like Pakistan. And he repeated not only in private discussions, but even in public discourse, he announced several times that Pakistan was an exception. It was not to be included in the list of unilateral concessions mm. category, and it was totally misunderstood. Of course, what General Bakshi is saying, maybe he has something else uh, in his mind, mm. which I did not know that perhaps he did dismantle some uh, order, order some dismantling of some of the uh, capabilities, operational capabilities of no, the country. But that may have been uh, on other grounds, hmm. may not be only on the ground because he said very clearly and he had told the American leaders, he had told all the world leaders that look, my Gujral doctrine applies to countries which are willing to accept India as an elder brother. So an elder brother has to be uh, generous, more than generous, but those countries which want either unilaterally or collectively to form some kind of an alliance against India and treat themselves mm. as equal or more than equal. Right. Therefore, there India will have to go on the basis of a quid pro quo. Absolutely. I want to put that to General Bakshi. General Bakshi, the agreement in the studio is that uh, former Prime Minister Gujral was very clear. We had no illusions about Pakistan. And he very clearly mentioned, like Mr. Shishang just mentioned, that he considered Pakistan to be outside the ambit to those countries that would get unilateral concessions from India. Then that that really kind of uh, puts water on your theory when, when you say that on Pakistan, Pakistan, the Gujral doctrine was uh, was faulty because he did understand that Pakistan was not supposed to be treated with kid gloves. Uh, you see, one would only say that today one is looking at it historically. I have the highest of respect for Mr. Gujral as a gentleman, as a very well-meaning politician who strove for peace in such a you know uh, neighborhood, cantankerous neighborhood. But the fact of the matter is, in historical terms, we have to judge things by their outcomes. What exactly were the outcomes? One of the problem areas was that you were dealing not with a civilian, you know, uh, whenever there has been a civilian government in Pakistan, it has only been a facade. Behind the stage, the deep state, the, the Pakistan army ISI complex is what runs the country. And these people were impervious, have been impervious to any such you know, gentle uh, approaches or such, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, liberal approaches or neo-realist approaches, if one may so state in terms of diplomaties. But the fact of the matter is that in the, in the process, we dismantled our covert action capabilities in Pakistan. Pakistan intensified its covert action capabilities. Please don't forget, this is the period that ends in the attack on the Indian parliament. You know, the terrorism spreads from just being confined to Jammu and Kashmir to the whole of India. You know, the countries almost come to war. The countries fight a limited war in Kargil. And the countries again come to almost a full-scale war in Operation Parakram. So, I mean, where is the response? The quid pro quo from Pakistan. How does they, did it help to alter state behavior right. in terms of what Pakistan was doing? Yeah. It only intensified the intransigence, unfortunately, and it increased the number of casualties to the Indian population. Right. And I once again would very humbly submit that it is the duty of the state 
as if it is the duty of the state to strive for peace it is equally the duty of the state to protect the life and liberty of its citizens right and i'm afraid this took a beating right i'd come to shashank right now then i'll come to mr sharma then whatever mr general bakshi is saying now uh, people would surmise from there that the ideal doctrine for uh, for for people who weren't very big fans of the gujarat doctrine was something used by ronald reagan which is called and i have it here dovariyai no Provide, trust but verify. Do you think that's a better doctrine for India to follow rather than the Gujral doctrine and its tenets? No, Gujral sir was only trying to create an atmosphere of trust. He knew very well that there are many different segments of opinion and decision making in Pakistan. It's a multi-layered process. In any country, it is a multi-layered process. And even in India, we would like very much to have all these various segments of the society to be united behind the civilian government. And not just treat it as a facade. Mm. In Pakistan, if there is a different matter, we would definitely like. And Gujarat Sahib thought that he would be able to strengthen to the extent possible the peace lobbies, the business lobbies, the uh, democratic lobbies in Pakistan. If he were to go this way, even other leaders also did the same thing. Atal Bihari Vajpayee uh, went across by bus to Lahore, and it was at that time that the democratic leader. who was talking peace with mr gujral earlier and then with mr bajpay no, either did not know that what his army chief was deciding at that time no. uh, the kargil operation or as army chief said that he was sleeping at that time perhaps or he did just is not understand what was being talked about at the cabinet meeting mm. so these are the kind of issues which are there so that means that india has to be a strong state i have nothing against that but it does not mean that you do not have a vision for india a vision for the region mm. and what we want to achieve in the next 15 20 years so mm. that that is very essential without that just to say that well we have to be hard state we have to buy as much equipment mm. hard equipment as much as possible right, right. we have to go and put everybody else on the defensive right. will just not work trust but verify would you think that would have been a better strategy rather than just going with uh, what mr gujral had no but what did gujral do when all this talk about mr gujral dismantling india's assets in pakistan uh, is all being said uh, by people uh, without adducing proof and may i ask that he was a prime minister for 11 months out of which he was a prime minister regular prime minister uh, for about 9 months because he was caretaker for about 3 or 4 months and do you think he had that kind of power and that kind of authority to order our top secret agencies to dismantle these assets maybe he ordered that don't push it because that will be running counter to his philosophy right. that gujral doctrine mm. but may i tell you one thing that you know i was it was around, around that period and later when mr wajpay came to power that it it became very fashionable to talk about hot pursuit mm. the hot pursuit of people who strike uh, in india and want to go back to the, uh, pakistan that in hot pursuit you must enter their territory mm. hot pursuit as a concept happens between two friendly countries mm -hmm. it doesn't happen between a hostile country to hostile countries mm -hmm. and if you do it it will lead to conflagration across the international borders mm -hmm. so make no mistake about this you see all this big talk about surgical strikes all the big talk about you know uh, you know uh, subverting the neighboring country you know these are clausewitzian concepts they have no relevance today mm -hmm. i mean you know today we are in a different world you have to strengthen yourself economic economically you have to show your muscle economically not as much in military terms as in technological terms as in scientific endeavor right, right. you know so i think gujral was one prime minister who was perhaps ahead of his times right. and uh, because he was ahead of his times he was mistaken because mr wajpay followed the good gujral doctrine without alluding to it and so is the current government doing tell me this relaxed visa regime you see mr rahman malik wanted to come to india to operationalize it mm. but the fact is that we are we have already operationalized our by part of the word bargain back then you see so i mean you see india as a philosophy as a policy at that point of time wanted people to come to this country and see for themselves 
that this is not a nation where Muslims are killed by the dozens on the streets every day. Hmm. Because that used to be propaganda right, of right. the very I, pernicious I, regime. I, I, want go, I, want that go, I want to go back to General Bakshi here. General Bakshi, we are approaching the end of our program, but I would like to one comment on this particular issue. Uh, uh, what is the relevance, if any, according to you, of the Gujarat doctrine in this day and age, when one doesn't know where and when the enemy will strike and nations and the elected gov uh, governments are not necessarily the enemy uh, or the ones working against us, the presence of non-state actors uh, who pretty much exist and operate outside the control of governments. What is the relevance of uh, Gu the Gujarat doctrine in today's age, according to you? Uh, look, all that I would state is that kindly compare it with the national responses in similar contexts. Please take a look at Hamas and Israel, the Hezbollah and Israel, and how that nation state has reacted to the loss of the lives of its citizens. In terms of hot pursuit, it has invaded, gone up to the Litani River. In terms of, you know, but it is going, uh, it has it has taken an eye for an eye. But, but General Bakshi, the Israel, the fact Israel is it also has, committing it genocide. I'm sure India costs. doesn't want to do that. No, no, but I mean, you want to keep uh, getting your citizens killed? I no, mean, it is ad nauseum that your citizens can be slaughtered? No, but that and just because some India of us are more genocide. protected than the others. I, I, I so, want to come. I, mean, I, I don't understand this argument. I, I want to come back to my studio guest. Very briefly, sir. We no, have I, mean, I, you know, General Bakshi has his point of view. I, you know, I just want to juxtaposition my part of view against his point of view. I'm not reacting to what he said. You see, do you think that India can do what Israel does to Hamas? Is Hamas a nuclear power? Is Hamas a country of the size? of Pakistan, does it have a standing army of the size of the Pakistani army? I think it's not a proper parallel. Mm. And let us stop this belligerent tone. Mm. India, countries that are strong, should act rather than stating. Mm. And we must act, and we must act wide operations which can't be attributed to us. Mm. Mm. If we have to really. But at the same time, I don't think we can really risk this kind of an adventure when it comes to a neighbor like Pakistan, which is nuclear armed. And you can't really compare Hamas to Pakistan. I want to close the show with uh, Mr. Shashank's comments. Uh, relevance of the Gujral doctrine right now. You heard both this guests, the General Bakshi and Vinod Sharma, wrap this up for us. What is the relevance of the Gujral doctrine? Has it served India well? Gujral doctrine was necessary to show that India is arriving on the world stage. Now that we have already reached that position, second part has come. And we have started moving into telling Pakistan that it has to be a peaceful neighborhood. Mm -hmm. In Afghanistan, we will watch its conduct very closely. The Americans have agreed to that. Most of the regional countries, including China, they are very keen that Afghanistan should remain a peaceful place. No terrorist activities to take place beyond the AFPAC region. And Pakistan should make its behavior more responsible. Right. So I think this is the next stage where we have reached. So mm -hmm. Gujarat doctrine is relevant to that extent. Mm -hmm. It, definitely it is not relevant to the extent that if we say that okay, Gujarat doctrine means that we have to be a weak state and we have to allow our citizens to be slaughtered, mm -hmm. definitely nobody would like to, to do that. So obviously. that we have to Absolutely. forget yeah. about. On that note, I must uh, end this program. I must thank also all my guests who joined me on the show. Vinod Sharma, thank you so much for joining us on The Big Picture. Shashank as well, thank you so much for coming to the studio. And general retired G.D. Bakshi who participated in the discussion. Thank you so much uh, for coming on The Big Picture. The views uh, can be different. Everyone can have a differing view. But of course, like my guest in the studio said the Gujarat doctrine came at a time when India needed it uh, and it did uh, arrive, signal the arrival of India on the international stage as a responsible regional giant and that I think uh, was pretty timely when it happened. Uh, that's all we have on the show uh, tonight. Till next time when we get you another edition of The Big Picture, this is Athar Khan saying goodbye, good night, and thank you for watching.